Hey there, this is Seth Chafer from Team Just Cause Robotics and the teams behind Bloodsport and Retrograde. Today I want to talk to you about RC radio communications in BattleBots, the different issues that can arise with them, and how just one wire breaking can be the difference between winning a fight and your robot coming to a halt, just like we saw with the fight between Captain Shredderator and Gigabyte. I'll also talk about how we approach this problem in Bloodsport and Retrograde so that we don't have the same kind of issues that a lot of other bots end up running into. Gigabyte vs Shredderator recap. Let's first take a look at how that Beyblade, I mean BattleBots match ended. You can see here if you really pay attention, it wasn't the last hit from Gigabyte that dealt the death blow, but actually Shredderator popping Gigabyte into the air. You can see that about a second after this hit, Shredderator starts moving at Gigabyte. And then, this is the moment where I think the radio connection was lost, because you see Shredderator just coasts to a stop, and from that moment on the weapon is just spinning down and the drive never does anything again. It can still roll around passively on its wheels when Gigabyte knocks into it, but there's clearly no controlled input from Captain Shredderator's driver, Brian Nave. In BattleBots, it's a safety requirement that if a radio connection is lost, the robots fail safe meaning that the drive-in weapon must come to a stop, and the weapon has to come to a complete stop within 60 seconds. So as soon as the connection was lost, all Shredderator could do was roll around while its weapon slowly came to a stop. Telemma what now? In the post-fight interview, Brian Nave said, quote, The radio died on us again. And, quote, Once we lose the telemetry, we know the radio is out. So what the hell is telemetry? Telemetry is simply information that a radio receiver sends back to a transmitter, which can provide information to the operator. In the simplest case, this is just an indication that the receiver is connected or a single strength indicator. In advanced cases, this could provide motor temperatures, current, voltage of different parts of the system, and even more in cases like Ribot with their special tablet they showed off in Season 5. When this info disappears, you know something's gone wrong, and the radio connection has been lost. RC Radio Transmitters While BattleBots competition machines are referred to as robots, these are kind of a bit more like an RC car on steroids than a factory robot arm. They operate almost 100% under human control from a wireless radio system. These radios are identical to ones you will see controlling FPV racing drones, RC airplanes and helicopters, and RC cars. This is because those radios all work at long range and are typically very reliable and easy to use, and you can find them at any hobby shop. Here's an example of a transmitter that's used very commonly at BattleBots, the FRSky Tenaris QX7. My version is fitted with a multi-protocol module, so I can control radio receivers from any brand instead of only FRSky receivers. But it functions the same as anyone else's on the show. RC Radio Receivers Now about the receivers themselves. Like I said, there are a ton of different brands, and within a given brand, they have all shapes and sizes. Each brand uses its own communication style known as a protocol. Realistically, the differences between these barely matter for combat robots, though. Receivers all feature a few specs that are important, such as the number of channels and the operating voltage range. The number of channels is how many devices a single receiver can control. For a PWM control signal, every device needs a ground wire, which is black, and a signal wire, typically white or yellow. Some devices either provide or use power from the receiver, which is usually around 5 volts, and these will have a middle red wire. These 3-pin connectors I call servo connectors are commonly found on pretty much all servos, electronic speed controllers, or ESCs, and interface with a single channel on a receiver. The voltage a receiver can accept varies, but typically it's much lower than the battery voltage in your robot, so you need to have a way to provide a lower voltage to power the receiver. Powering Receivers Probably the most devastating failure that can occur in a robot is loss of power to a receiver. Even if every single motor and ESC in your robot is getting power, if you have one receiver and your receiver is not, your bot is dead in the water, just like Shredderator was after this fight. This can be especially frustrating, because it might seem like your robot suffered absolutely no damage, but just one wire breaking or getting cut or snagged or unplugged, and your bot's dead. Relying on a single battery to power everything in your whole robot can cause all sorts of problems as the battery voltage drops over time as it's drained, and it can temporarily droop from high current demands, causing what is known as a brownout, where the robot loses power just for a moment. This could cause the receiver to lose its connection with the radio, but usually, after that, it'll reconnect and regain control after a few seconds. Plus, in BattleBots, every single robot uses main batteries that are way too high voltage to power a receiver directly. 
usually 20 to 60 volts. The second option, which is popular in BattleBots and larger weight classes, is to just use a separate receiver battery. This is what we do in Bloodsport and Retrograde. We have electronics boxes, which I'll talk more about in a minute, that each contain a 2S LiPo that's around 7.2 volts, and these can directly power a receiver that tolerates a range of 5 to 10 volts. This eliminates the possibility of a power surge affecting the main batteries from causing a receiver to lose power. And it can also reduce the risk of problems relating to electromagnetic interference or EMI, which can happen as a result of having receiver power or signal wires too close to your motors, speed controllers, or other high current carrying wires. However, these extra batteries use up a lot of space and weight. Using a BEC or battery elimination circuit is therefore another common solution. A BEC eliminates the use for a separate receiver battery, that is, at a lower voltage than that the receiver needs. It simply steps down the voltage from the main batteries, usually to about 5 volts. As long as the voltage of the main battery doesn't drop too low, this can be very reliable. Some speed controllers have BECs built in that you can use, but this runs the risk of losing control of your entire robot even if only that one ESC blows up, so I prefer using an external one. Possible issues so to recap, a receiver is a little component that takes radio signals from the air, interprets those, and communicates them to servos, ESCs, and motors, or whatever else it is connected to through the signal wires, and it needs power from some low voltage source. In some cases, the receiver takes signals from onboard sensors or ESCs and relays that info back to the transmitter as telemetry to be seen by the driver. If any signal wire comes unplugged, the device to which it's connected will stop, but everything else should keep going. If one speed controller blows up, there's a sudden shock to a motor, or there's a short circuit somewhere, this could cause a massive current spike inside of a bot. Those current spikes can cause EMI problems, or induce voltage spikes in signal wires or power wires connected to a receiver. And in some cases, this could even fry the receiver. If that happens, everything stops. If your receiver is powered by a BEC, which somehow dies, everything stops. If the receiver power wires are cut, unplugged, somehow, everything stops. If you lose signal due to a damaged antenna, interference, or the metal in your robot blocking the radio waves, everything stops. So there are a lot of possible causes for everything to just stop. Bloodsport's setup. I have a detailed video showing our approach to preventing all of these problems in Bloodsport from before Season 5, and I'll link that below if you want to get into all the nitty gritty details for the whole electronics setup. For now though, I'll show a clip from that video which explains how our receivers are set up in the bot. One of the cool features about uh, Bloodsport 2 is that we have this custom RX board, meaning we actually can have two different radio controllers for the drive that we can switch over to if we needed to. Say one RX died, we can switch over to the second RX. So we actually have all these LEDs here that signify what's on. Uh, you can see these LEDs, they um, signify what's on, on and off. So this, these two internal signals, this one RX is currently on. You can see the ESC the code power. Um, so if you look on the other side here, you can actually see the external signal from the other side is currently on. So what the heck is all that? Well, remember I talked a lot about EMI caused by powerful motors and ESCs in the robot? To prevent any sort of voltage spikes in the signal wires from killing our receivers, these are passed through opto-isolators in a circuit board, which are essentially a little blinking LED and light sensor. This makes it so that no matter what voltage is on one end of the isolator, only the digital signal, and not the voltage or current itself, can pass through. There is no direct electrical connection between the signal channels on the receiver and the signal channels on the ESCs. To further prevent any sort of single receiver failure from killing our whole robot, we have four. Two in each electronics box, and we have two transmitters. Each electronics box has its own receiver battery powering the two receivers inside. Justin's transmitter normally controls the drive, and for Season 5, Aaron was controlling the weapon with his own transmitter. If either transmitter died though, the other could take over for both. Both electronics boxes controlled half the robot, so one box has the ESCs for two weapon motors and half the drive, and both the receivers would need to die at the same time for us to lose that entire half of the robot. Except, actually, we still wouldn't, because on top of all of that, Justin's fancy PCB allows the signals to be shared from one electronics box to the other on the other side of the robot. So we shouldn't lose control of all four weapon motors and all four drive motors, even if three of the receivers in the bot die. There's almost no way a single failure could totally incapacitate the robot. Retrograde's setup is a little bit different because we have a lifter. 
For the lifting arm on Retrograde, we actually just gave it its own set of batteries, its own motor, its own ESC, and its own receiver. So even if the arm ESC explodes and takes out its receiver with it, nothing else on the bot should be affected. We still have the same electronics boxes, which each have two receivers for the two drive speed controllers inside on each side. So we would again need to lose three receivers in order for the drive to give out on the whole robot. And we also have the dual VESC speed controllers on top of one electronics box to run the two Scorpion motors in the other cutter, and a single 300 amp VESC on top of the second electronics box to run the lifter motor. We have the exact same approach for the flamethrower attachment. It has its own receiver, battery, and electronics, so if we don't have weight for it, we can remove the whole thing without impacting any of the rest of the system. Conclusion Like I said, there are a ton of different things that could happen which would cause a failure like we saw with Shredderator, and I'm sure they will detail exactly what went wrong in the later fight report. It would be baseless speculation to try and determine exactly what failure or set of failures occurred from all that we can see on the TV show. I have a link in the description to Shredderator's post-fight breakdown from their first fight, and when they post a breakdown of this fight, I'm sure you'll find it there too. I've also linked to the full video where I dive into Bloodsports Electronics for Season 5. If you want to see more breakdown videos like this, check out my last one about the Tombstone Shredderator fight if you haven't already. Also, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss it when my next one gets posted. If you liked this video, make sure to hit like. If you didn't, well, you can hit the other button too and see if it does anything. And as always, thanks for watching.